G. Marshall. Welcome to the sound of suspense. Welcome to the fear you can hear. But mostly, welcome to the world of terrifying imagination. The story you are about to hear is a love story. But a love story which begins at the point where many love stories end. It begins after the wedding march has been played. After the vows of love and fidelity exchanged. It begins on the honeymoon. In a strange and terrifying fashion. Don't! Don't! Don't come near me! Stay! Stay away from me, Dad! Susan, are you out of your head? I saw her picture! Do you hear me? I found her picture! On our honeymoon! Our mystery drama, Deadly Honeymoon, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Henry Slesser and stars Betsy von Furstenberg and Michael Wager. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. I'll return shortly with... Our story begins 36,000 feet in the air on a flight which departed from New York's Kennedy Airport and in another hour will be touching down at O'Hare Airport in Chicago. There are almost a hundred passengers on this flight, but an observant stewardess is giving special attention to that handsome couple in seats 18A and 18B. Perhaps it's because all honeymooners have a special radiance. Are you sure you wouldn't like some more coffee? Oh, no, thanks. Not for me. I wouldn't mind a cup. Here you are. Thanks. Just ring if you need anything else. You'd think we were the only people on this flight. As far as I'm concerned, we are. Oh, Dan, I feel absolutely drunk with happiness. Is that a funny word for the way I feel? No. It's a great word, Susan. I was flying hours before we got on the plane. Oh, what time did you say we land in Chicago? About 2.30. Is it, is it far from the airport to the hotel? No, actually, it's only about a half an hour from O'Hare to downtown. About uh, 16 miles. Still, I don't think we'll have time to make Evanston today, do you? Hmm. Well, it might be better to go in the morning. You can call your aunt from the hotel. Dan, you sure you don't mind going to Evanston? I mean, I just couldn't possibly be a few miles away and not see Aunt Clara. Besides, I want to show off my new husband to somebody, and she's all the family I have. Was she your mother's sister? No, no, my father. She came east when my parents were killed in that crash. Stayed with me for a, a month or so. <laughs> that was about the most that either one of us could stand. She sounds like a holy terror. Oh, no, she's just crotchety, that's all. But she'll only be more crotchety if she learns that I passed through Chicago and didn't even stop by. Well, and what kind of work are you in, Mr. Carey? All right, now, we like to say we're management consultants, Mrs. Rowland. But we also do a, quite a bit of executive recruitment. I don't understand a word of that. Dan helps corporations find the right people for important jobs, Aunt Clara. His firm is the biggest in the field, isn't it, Dan? Well, it's always hard to measure business like ours. But it has offices everywhere, doesn't it? In most of the major cities, yes. And now Dan is going to take over the branch in San Francisco. He's going to manage the entire thing. Is that some kind of a promotion? Oh, of course it is. I asked the gentleman, Susan, speak when you're spoken to. Oh, sorry. Yes, Mrs. Rowland, it is a promotion. Truth is, it's a job that everyone in my office has been after. Oh, it's just worked out so beautifully for us. I mean, Dan having to move to San Francisco. We're sort of combining a business trip with a cross-country honeymoon. And where do you go from here? 
Well, we're planning to stay two days in Chicago, and then we're going to Dallas. We're going to cross the Rio Grande in New Mexico. I know a great little hotel in Monterey. Then we're going to Las Vegas. To gamble, I suppose? Well, it's no fun going to Las Vegas if you don't gamble a little. Your father never gambled for so much as a dime, Susan. That wasn't the way he made his fortune. Well, I promise not to bankrupt the family, Aunt Clara. Anyway, we're just staying in Las Vegas overnight, and then going to Los Angeles. Three days later, I report to work. Thoroughly exhausted, of course. <laughs> Well, that's your idea of a honeymoon. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, Susan, I suppose lunch is almost ready. You want to help me bring it out? Oh, yes, of course. Kitchen's this way in case you've forgotten. The truth is, I have. I'm glad to be able to talk to you alone for a minute, Susan. Did you like Dan, Aunt Clara? Isn't he good-looking? Older than you, isn't he? What difference does that make? How long did you know him? Oh, we we met at a party at the Williamson's. Do you remember my friend, Tracy Williamson? Didn't ask you where you met. I'm asking you when. Well, <laughs> it was about three weeks ago. Three weeks? Oh, for the love of heaven, Susan. Aunt Clara, the time you know somebody isn't always the most important thing. He's practically a stranger. How can you be sure of anything about a man you've known for three weeks? From the time we met, I saw Dan every single day. Susan, when a girl is all alone in the world, when she has independent means Please, of her own... Please, don't start in about Dan being a fortune hunter. I don't have that much money, and it's all in trust anyway. And I assure you, Dan earns enough income to take care of us both very well. Well, I'm sorry, Susan. I know I don't have any control over what you do. You're too old for that. But I've seen something of the world, too, you know... And the most important lesson I've ever learned is never trust a stranger. Oh, and Claire, that's ridiculous. Now, can we bring out the lunch? I don't know. I just, I just have the feeling that Chicago wasn't all you expected it to be. Well, we weren't there very long, Dan. And don't forget, we, we spent half the time with your business associate. Oh, honey, I, I am sorry about that. I suppose I never should have called Bill Kincaid to say we're in town. Should have known he'd insist on getting together. Oh, it wasn't that bad. I just didn't know what he was talking about half the time. All those office politics. Yes. Well, Bill loves to gossip. But you can see what I mean about the San Francisco job. Everybody in the company wanted it. They'll never get over resenting me for being picked. But... I am sorry if you were bored. It's all right, Dan, really. After all, I inflicted Aunt Clara on you. She was okay. Well, I know you didn't find her very friendly. Well, why should she be? I think she's a very protective type. Anybody you married would get her John to die. Yes, I suppose that's true enough. Dan, how long did you know Terry Williamson? Who? Terry, my ex-roommate. We met each other at her house. Or have you forgotten that already? Tell you the truth, darling. I didn't know whose house I was at that night. Oh, so Terry wasn't the one who invited you? No. The man named Bob Chambers, one of the executives. I got placed at General Utilities. So don't ask me who invited him, because I don't know. I see. So it was all sort of roundabout. What's the difference? Still turned out to be the best party I ever attended. Yeah. Hey. Oh, no, of course not. Nothing at all. Uh, Dan, where did you say we were staying in Dallas? It's a little hotel called the Lazy Sea. It's a rustic, but I think you'll like it. Besides, we'll only be there one night. We'll rent a car in the morning and drive down to Monterey. You really know all the offbeat places, don't you? Well, when you travel around enough, I, I guess you begin looking for them. You haven't done that much traveling on the job, have you? Huh? Well, no, not that. Do you know the name of the airport in Dallas? Um, I forget. It's called Love Field. Isn't that a great name for honeymooners? <laughs> yes. Hi, Susan. Oh, there you are. I was starting to worry. No, I had a little trouble with the phone lines back to New York, but I got through okay. Everything all right? Yeah, sure, everything's fine. Hey, <laughs> you look a little strange, though. Oh, no, I'm all right. I had a drink while I was waiting for you. Say, you better watch that tequila. It sneaks up on you like a bandito. Actually, 
something sort of funny happened. What do you mean? Dan, when we were in Chicago in that in that restaurant, I forget the name of it. The place we went to with Bill? Yes, when you and your friend were talking about all the office politics back in New York, I saw this, this man looking at us. What man? Well, he was at the bar. I'm not even sure why I noticed him. He was wearing this plaid raincoat. I remember wondering if it had started to rain. I guess you were just bored with all our talk. Anyway, I saw him turn to look at us. Probably to look at you. Can't blame him for that. The funny thing is, as soon as you turned around, he got up very quickly and left. Susan, I don't remember seeing anyone in a plaid raincoat. And I'm afraid I don't see anything unusual about it. Well, I guess I didn't either. I probably wouldn't have given it another thought, but I... I think I saw that same man here again today. In Monterey? Oh, you're kidding. I can't swear it was him. I didn't get a good look at his face the first time. All I really noticed was the coat. And you saw the coat again? Is that it? Yes. He was carrying it over his arm. Oh, darling. You know the story about the airport truck? Airport truck? No. Well, this guy on a plane looks out the window and sees one of those little red airport trucks. You know, fueling the plane, bringing food aboard, something like that. Anyway, the plane takes off from New York and lands in Chicago. Another little red truck comes out to meet it. The guy next to him says, Hey, we made good time, didn't we? And he says, Yeah, but that little red truck really made time. <laughs> well, I can see that I didn't marry a great audience. Oh, I'm sorry, Dan. It, it's just, it, it bothered me a little. Oh, forget it. And speaking of airports, next up, the City of Angels. <laughs> This week's digest. Oh, I see it. Excuse me. Yes? You're Mrs. Daniel Carey, aren't you? Why, yes, I am. Do I know you? No, Mrs. Carey, but I know you. Saw your husband leaving the hotel about half an hour ago. Are you planning on meeting him? Oh, wait a minute. I've seen you before. Have you? You're the man with the coat, the plaid raincoat. Well, you happen to be right. I do own a plaid raincoat, but with this nice sunny weather... Excuse me. Look, Mrs. Carey, I know it seems as if I'm following yes, you. Yes, it does. Well, okay, it's true. But I've had a reason. Such as? Could we talk about it someplace? There's a coffee shop in the hotel. I'm sorry. I don't even know who you are. Maybe it would help if I introduced myself. My name is Harrington. Lieutenant Gail Harrington, attached to the New York City Police Department. Police? That's right, Mrs. Carey. So you see, what I have to discuss with you is police business. But what what have I done? It's nothing you've done. It concerns your husband. And what he might do. It looks like Dan and Susan Carey's honeymoon is in for a surprise. Or perhaps more than one. Maybe Susan will soon wonder if her Aunt Clara wasn't right about a number of things. Including her cynical advice about trusting no strangers. We'll find out about the new stranger in Susan's life when I return shortly with Act Two. Now another tale of the bar and chase. Ed Kellogg's special case presents... Presents Last Tango in Pittsburgh. There I was at Raoul's All Right Tango Lounge. My little orchid, will you tango with me? It was Raoul. You're a splendid dancer. But what was that? I was what? That sound effect. Oh, I'm a few pounds overweight. And this ball and chain points out how my extra weight can get in the way. I'm pointing you back to your chair. Oh, Our heroine decided to lose that extra weight. She exercised and ate smart every meal, starting with a special key with a bowl of special case, skim milk, tomato juice, and coffee. It's less than 240 calories, 99% fat-free, and 100% delicious. After a while, she was rid of the ball and chain and back at Raoul. Darling, you're looking fantastic. What a happy ending. What the ending? We're just getting started. Raoul, hmm? get lost. Your happy ending could begin with the Kellogg Special K breakfast. And that's another day of the ball and chain. This is WOR New York, your mystery theater station. No matter what 
it's saving for. That's what suburban savings for suburban. Suburban Savings offers you a regular savings account with flexibility. You can add any amount to your account whenever you wish. Withdraw whenever you want. Suburban Savings pays a 5.25% annual interest rate on regular savings paid quarterly, which earns an annual effective yield of 5.47%. Interest is compounded continuously from day of deposit to day of withdrawal, as long as $50 is maintained in the account to the end of the quarter. Come into Suburban Savings and open an account with flexibility. Our regular savings account in New Jersey at Bayonne, Edgewater, Elmwood Park, Emerson, Hackettstown, Morris Plains, Nutley, Paramus, and Sparta. In the pleasant, cheerful atmosphere of a coffee shop in a large Los Angeles hotel, newlywed Susan Carey finds herself facing a man she has never seen before. A man whose solemn eyes look at her over a steaming cup of coffee and seem to warn her of nightmares to come. But so far, Lieutenant Gail Harrington of the New York Police Department is merely asking questions. How long have you been married now? Only about ten days. Was it a long engagement? Did you know your husband for some time before? No. No, not very long. Well, could you could you be more specific? How long ago did you meet him? And where? Well, it's a month now. Just about that. A month. Hmm. Then you really don't know much about him, do you? Oh, you and Aunt Clara... Beg pardon? Lieutenant, will you please tell me what this is about? Has my husband committed some crime? Is that what you're implying? Oh, I didn't say that, Mrs. Carey. But believe me, it would be helpful to both of us if you could just tell me a little bit about the circumstances. You know, I don't see why this has to be so one-sided. Now, please bear with me. All right. I met Dan at a party at a friend's house about a month ago. We talked a lot. We liked each other. We started dating. I saw him every single day. Uh, what business did he tell you was in? Oh, you make it sound as if he lied to me. No, I didn't mean to do that. He's a management consultant. I know he is. He's just gotten a very important job in San Francisco. Head of the entire office. We're going there tomorrow. So that was the purpose of the trip. Yes. But since you've been married ten days, I gather it's a honeymoon as well. Well, naturally it is. Yes, naturally. Miss Carey, do you know if your husband was ever married before? Married? No. Are you really certain? It's police business. But tell me that Dan's a bigamist or something? No, Mrs. Carey, certainly not that. Then what is it? I've got to tell you, but you have to... have to understand one thing. Now, I am not assigned to this case anymore. My interest is strictly unofficial. I may be completely mistaken, but you're the only one who can prove it one way or another. Prove What? About whether your husband ever called himself Don Crawford. And once, four years ago, David Chase. See? All the same initials, like Dan Carey. You are saying he's a criminal. Not just a criminal, Mrs. Carey. A wife killer. You're crazy. I hope so. Believe me, I do. Let me start at the beginning. If you still think I'm crazy by the time I'm finished, I'll be happy to buy you that coffee and go on my way. But if you think I'm not, if you have any doubts, then I want you to tell me so and let me help you. All right. Go on. I know you're wrong, but go on. I first heard of Don Crawford back in 1965 when I was attached to the homicide detail in the Los Angeles PD. Mrs. Crawford was the former Edith Burbank. She was the youngest daughter of a wealthy family in Baltimore. Only when I saw her, she was never going to enjoy her money anymore. She was dead. Her throat had been cut by one of those, quote, mysterious intruders, unquote, that the papers liked to write about. Her husband, Don, was broken-hearted, naturally. Had only been married four weeks. But her death also made him some money... Uh, not a fortune, really. There was a 
mix-up about her will, and he ended up with nothing but a handsome payoff from the family. Mrs. Carey, are you okay? I... I can't believe I'm sitting here listening to this... I won't be long, I promise. Anyway, I was assigned to the Crawford case, and I didn't exactly cover myself with glory. You mean you never found the mysterious intruder? That's right. So naturally, you decided that maybe there wasn't any. Let me go on, Mrs. Carey. Okay? Yes. Yes, go on. Anyway, I ran into a similar case about four years ago. The murder of a young bride fresh from her honeymoon. A broken-hearted groom named David Chase. I thought Chase and Crawford were one and the same man. But I couldn't convince the district attorney of the resemblance. But I am still convinced, Mrs. Carey. And you think Dan is the same person? Oh, he's changed again, of course. His hair is lighter than Chase's. He's thinner and paler. But there's something about the face I can't forget. And even if it's true, you still have no proof. Is that it? You couldn't solve your case, so you're holding on to your first solution. Wait, Mrs. Carey. Let me tell you why I was so sure that Crawford and Chase were the same man. It was because of the honeymoon. What? It's my theory that their honeymoons were identical. A compulsive honeymoon, you might say. That is ridiculous. Criminals are like that. Creatures of habit, most of them. Afraid to change a pattern, maybe for fear that their luck will change with it. What do you mean by it? I stumbled on the coincidence accidentally. But as far as I could trace it, Don Crawford and David Chase took their brides to the same places. They did the same things. And I knew that if I ever saw that pattern duplicated... I would have my killer. I hope I'm wrong, Mrs. Carey. But you are the only one who can tell me. And my first question is this. Was your first stop Chicago? Yes. Yes, of course it was. And you knew that. That's where we first saw you in Chicago in that restaurant. Okay, okay. I just wanted to make sure. You can't possibly make something out of that. Dan wanted to see people in the Chicago office, and I thought it would be nice to visit my aunt in Evanston. She's my family. Was your next stop after Chicago in Texas? Yes. We went to Dallas. Dallas is a wonderful place to visit, Lieutenant. I don't see anything so peculiar about that. Both Chase and Crawford went to Dallas. They chose offbeat hotels. I guess they didn't care to be seen very much. Where did you stay in Dallas? It was a perfectly nice hotel. I, I don't think you could describe it as offbeat. No. And then the next stop would be Monterey. You knew we were in Monterey because that's where I saw you the second time. By that time, Mrs. Carey, I'd made up my mind to follow you. Are you saying that these... These supposed white killers you're talking about also went to Monterey? Yes, they did. And from Monterey to Las Vegas. Well... Then you're wrong, Lieutenant. You're completely wrong. You mean you didn't go to Vegas? No. So there goes your famous theory, doesn't it? Well, I, I admit I'm We surprised. changed our mind about Vegas. We decided that we might be too tempted to gamble away all the money we had for the trip. Ah, so you did have it on the schedule. Well, yes. Yes, we did, but we didn't go. <laughs> I really think that changes the pattern. The fact that you didn't go. Oh, please, I... I can't stand any more of this. I... I don't want to hear any more of Mrs. Carey, Edith Burbank was killed in Los Angeles. In her hotel room. This hotel. I'm leaving. I'm leaving. I'm Mrs. leaving right Mrs. Carey, now. wait. You're wrong. You're wrong. You've got Dan mixed up with someone else. Let me finish, please. Just one more oh, moment. please. No, no, no. Please let me go. <laughs> Well, there you are. Oh. I didn't realize that, that you were back already. Yeah. I told you I wouldn't be gone more than half an hour. I, I thought you'd be in the room. I... Uh, I went downstairs to get a magazine. Didn't they have any? <laughs> well, I... I guess I forgot to buy one. I got to looking in the windows of the dress shops, and I, I forgot my original purpose completely. Susan. Are, are you Okay. Of course. Why do you ask? I don't know. You, you've got that funny look in your eyes again. Have I? Doesn't matter. There's still the two most 
beautiful eyes in the world. Hey. What is it? Don't tell me the honeymoon's over so soon. Why do you say that? Uh, that was like kissing a snowman. I guess I... I just don't feel like myself today. I think maybe... Oh, all, all this traveling has worn me down a little. Oh, I am. I'm sorry. Well, we, we don't have much further to go. Just one more plane trip to San Francisco. Yes. Look, maybe you'd rather not go out tonight. Maybe you ought to stay in, order some dinner in the room. I don't mind. But you wanted to go to that restaurant, the one you told me about. You've been looking forward to it. The landmark? Yeah, yeah. Well, I did want to try the place. It was supposed to be really spectacular. But you've never eaten there before. Well, no, how could I? I've never been in L.A. before. I was thinking today that, well, you seemed to know the city so well when we drove around. You, you didn't seem to have the slightest trouble. Streets are very well marked in this town. It's really a pleasure to drive here. I... Look, you know what I think? I think you ought to take a nap before dinner. Yes. I was thinking of lying down, but I don't think I can sleep. Okay, then. Just, just read your magazine. Wait a minute. You haven't got one. I'll take care of that. Where are you going? Going to get my bride something to read. How about a nice magazine about cooking? You know, I never did ask you if you can cook. Just get me a news magazine of some kind, all right? Uh-huh, the brainy type. <laughs> I should have known. See you in ten minutes. I'll take the key so so you won't have to get up. Yes. All right. Oh, dear God. It can't be true. It just can't be any truth to what that man said he... He's made a mistake. A terrible mistake. Down his luggage. His initials, D.C. Oh, but anyone could have those initials. Anyone. I wonder if... It's open. Oh, for heaven's sake, what am I doing? Searching my husband's luggage like... Like some kind of hotel thief. No. I won't do it. I won't. I'm not going to believe any of it. I won't. <gasps> Who's that? Hello? This is Carrie. It's Gail Harrington. Leave me alone. Stop bothering me. You shouldn't have run off like that, Mrs. Carey. You didn't give me a chance to finish what I was saying. I told you. I, I don't want to hear any more. It's... It isn't true. You've made a mistake, Lieutenant. Your husband is at the newsstand right now, Mrs. Carey. I can see him from where I'm standing at the house phones. And the more I look at him, the more sure I am that I'm right. No, you're wrong. I want you to hear the rest of the story about Crawford and David Chase and what they did on their honeymoon. Maybe what I told you before didn't convince you, but if you heard a few more things... I'm going to hang up, Lieutenant, right now. I wanted you to know where Don Crawford took his wife the night she was murdered in a room. He took her to a restaurant called The Landmark. You ever hear of it? Mrs. Carey? Hey, are you listening? No. No, I'm not listening. I won't listen. <laughs> And so, Susan Carey seems to have a date at the Landmark Restaurant in Los Angeles with her loving husband, Dan. If she keeps the date, something tells me that she's not going to do their cuisine very much justice. Because one needs peace of mind to enjoy good food. Fear affects the salivary glands, and terror ruins the taste buds. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. I'm High Brown, producer of Radio Mystery Theater, and I'm most enthusiastic about this new adventure in modern radio. Here's what listeners are telling us. Your program was absolutely great. Don't oil the door. Or again, you've got yourself a winning show. We'd like your reactions, too. Right now, we're in the last week of our drawing for 50 prizes a week. Two AM FM stereo phonos, two travel clock radios, and 46 anthologies of modern suspense. 
just mail your name and address, and you're eligible, to Mystery Theater, Box 50, Radio City Station, New York, 10019. That's Box 50, Radio City Station, New York, 10019. Entries must be postmarked no later than Saturday, January 26th. Offer good everywhere unless locally prohibited. This is WOR New York, your mystery theater station. An invitation. This is Peter Roberts. Join us Sunday morning, 8.15 to 10 here on WOR for Rambling with Roberts. Two hours of music, uh, specially selected for Sunday morning listening pleasure, along with uh, full bits of weather information, news headlines, uh, bits of trivia such as the fact that... uh, A man from Onoa, Iowa, received a patent for what he called Eskimo Pie, which was ice cream coated with chocolate. It all happened in 1922. may not seem like very much in the way of history, but it does take place, these little bits of trivia and information, on Rambling with Roberts. So, of a Sunday morning, make a note. 8.15 to 10, right here at 7.10 on your dial, come Rambling with Roberts. You don't have to give us an RSVP. Just be on hand. Thank you. Well, what have we here? A quiet meal for two at the Landmark Restaurant? No. We seem to be in a hotel room. The same room in which we last saw our honeymooning couple, Susan and Dan Carey. Obviously, there's been a change of plan. Room service has provided the meal for the two lovers this evening. Can it be that Susan Carey has decided that if there is a pattern, it must be broken? Have some more wine, honey? No. I really don't think I want any. Hey, come on. You know what this bottle cost? (laughs) You shouldn't have been so extravagant. Uh Uh-oh. That sounds more like a wife than a bride. Well, $18 is an awful lot for a wine, Dan. Especially when I... I really can't drink that much of it. I just wanted to make up... Well, never mind. You mean for not taking me to the landmark? (laughs) No, it doesn't really matter. I told you, it's, it's fun leaving the room. Very elegant. I'm sure you were disappointed there. No, I... I really wasn't. Look, we're not going to be very far from Los Angeles. We'll probably fly down from San Francisco a few times a year. There are dozens of wonderful restaurants in San Francisco, too, aren't there? So they tell me. I'll ask the guys at the office for recommendations. I think this food is quite good, don't you? Yeah, sure. It's... It's fine. Tastes even better with the wine. Well, all right. I'll have some more, I guess. That a girl. Now, look, I'm not trying to get you drunk, you understand, so I can take advantage of you. Although, come to think of it... Dad, oh, don't. You almost knocked the table over. (laughs) I guess I got a little carried away. You look very delectable in that robe. Oh, did you really like it? Irresistible. I didn't take much of a wardrobe with me. You said you were going to buy clothes in San Francisco. Yes, if I can find out where to go, I... I'll take you down to Union Square. I hear that's the place. Oh, I have told you about the weekend, haven't I? No. What about it? Well, I thought we'd get our first look at the town by taking one of those Circle Line cruises. Is that okay with you? Oh, yes, that, that sounds lovely. Ah. I love to see places by water. And if we can squeeze it in, we might go picnicking in Golden Gate Park. They've got this Japanese tea garden. It's supposed to be very nice. Yes. All sounds wonderful, Dan. Susan, I... I just wish you felt better. Maybe you ought to check with the hotel doctor in case you picked up a bug or something. Do I look that bad to you? No. You look just great to me. Darling. Yeah, I think that'd be a good idea, honey. Reserve the car ahead of time. Then we can pick it up right away in San Francisco. Whatever you think, Dan. You wait right here. I'll go over to the counter. He's all right. Be back in ten minutes. All right, Dan. Mrs. Carey. Oh, no. Not you again. I didn't mean to startle you. Go away. Please go away. 
I don't want to see you anymore. I hear anything you have to say. Now, I know that I seem to be persecuting you or something. As you can see, Lieutenant, I am in perfectly good health. I was not murdered in my sleep in that hotel room. Look, Mrs. Carey, I've only got a few minutes before your husband gets back. I just wanted to finish my story about this other guy, this David Chase. I don't care if you are a policeman. I'll call someone and have you arrested for bothering me. David Chase's wife didn't get killed in Los Angeles. She died in San Francisco. Where? In a hotel room? No, not there. But they stayed at the San Remo. Is that where you're staying? Yes, but millions of people do. No, there wasn't any mysterious intruder this time. In fact, Mrs. Chase's death was listed officially as an accident. She had a little too much to drink at dinner, and her feet got tangled up on top of a very steep hill. The fall broke her neck. It was her very first day in San Francisco. She and her husband had quite a day, too. They took one of those boat cruises to see the city. Then they went to Golden Gate Park to the Japanese tea garden. Miss Carey, are you okay? No. No, I'm... I'm not okay. How could I be? That night they went to a restaurant called the Vendôme. That's where the lady drank too much, at least according to her husband. Oh, dear God. Listen, Mrs. Carey, I can't follow you anymore. I've got a job to get back to. I want you to take this. Con. Quiet. Don't draw anyone's attention to us. Just take it. If I'm wrong and you don't need it, fine. Just throw it away. No. I don't want I it. I cannot have you on my conscience, don't you understand? All right. Yes, all right. I'll take it. I still say you're wrong. I hope so. But I don't think I am. Hello? Mrs. Carey? Yes? This is the message desk. Your husband left a message here for you at four o'clock. Oh, I've been out until now. Hey, would you like me to read it to you? Uh, yes, please. It says, we'll be at the office until six. Should be there no later. Dan. Oh, yes. Thank you very much. Welcome. Bye. Bye. Six thirty. Six twenty now. Oh, God. Why do I keep staring at his luggage? Why can't I just forget about it? No. It isn't dishonest. It's just something I have to do. No, no, nothing in this one but clothing. This one has papers and things. Lost documents. Birth certificate. Honorable discharge. U.S. Navy. Daniel Eldon Carey. That is his name. It is. That Matt Harrington was wrong. Doesn't this mean he was wrong? Or does it just mean that... Oh. I'm not going to start thinking that way. These look like... Photographs. Maybe it's family... Oh, no, wait. This picture is signed. It's your pretty girl. It's Dan... All my love forever, Edith. Edith. What was the name he said? That policeman, what was the name that man's wife was? Wasn't it Edith? Oh, no. Who is it? It's me, honey. Oh, uh, one second. Hi, sweetheart. Sorry. I forgot to take my key. Hey, I'm not late, am I? I told him at the desk I'd be back at six... Well, it's not even that. Hey, why is it so dark in here, Susan? Oh, I just... I just got back myself. I... I didn't think of turning on all the lights. Susan, I have a confession to make. <laughs> I wasn't at the office at all. My new staff thought they ought to christen the new boss. I tell you one thing about San Francisco... It's a hard drinking town. <laughs> Susan, what's the matter? Dan. 
I found her picture. What? I found her picture. Your first wife's. What are you talking about? I was never married. Then what's her picture doing in your luggage? Hey, 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 what's going on here? You must be drunk as Look, I am. Stay away from me, Dan. Susan, are you out of your head? I found her picture. Did you hear me? I found her picture. On our honeymoon. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You, do you mean Edith? I know all about her. Yes, and about the other one. She drank too much, too, didn't she? She was drunk. Now, well, look, will you calm down? Is that what you were planning to do tonight? Get me drunk at the restaurant? You were going to take me out to dinner tonight, weren't you? Of course I was. I asked one of the guys if he... Well, I can tell you the restaurant he picked. Do you want me to tell you the name of the restaurant, Dan? It's the Von Dome, isn't it? What? What? Well, yes. It is. How did you know that? Because... I don't know what the trouble is, but you've got to be sick. You need help. No, 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 you've been acting funny ever since we left Chicago. I'm warning you. Look. Look. My God. I've got a gun. Susan, put that down. I'm not going to end up like that. Give me that thing, Susan. Don't. Oh, don't, Susan. Susan. I don't want to shoot you. <laughs> One second. Well. Mr. Harvey. Mrs. Carey. I didn't know that you were... Um, look, let me just get a shirt on. I was just shaving. I'm sure you're surprised to see me, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah, I am. I... I didn't expect that you'd... Uh, what, what brings you back to L.A.? I'm sure you know, Mr. Harvey. That is the right name, isn't it? Not... Harrington? <laughs> I guess that means you know all about my little joke. The gun wasn't a joke, was it? The gun was real. Now, look, I can tell you're upset, but I didn't mean any harm. I mean, I like Dan. I really you do. You despised my husband, Mr. Harvey. Why don't you admit it? You hated the fact that he got the job you wanted in San Francisco. And all you got was an assistant manager's job in Chicago. Uh, you are wrong. I just thought it would be a good gag, a good joke on Danny Boy. Yes. I've heard about your reputation. The great practical joker. You thought of a great one this time. Yeah, but that's all it was. You gave Dan the itinerary for our honeymoon trip. You were just being helpful, of course. You gave him all the names and places... All the benefit of your traveling experience. That was a gag. See, I thought if Dan took you to all the places I listed for you him... You even knew about Edith, the girl he was once engaged to, the one who died. She became his murder victim in your little fantasy. What did you think would happen, Mr. Harvey? Did I get frightened enough to kill Dan so that you might get the job he took away from you? Uh, listen, is, 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 is Dan all right? I thought you might want this back, Mr. Harvey. Your gun. Oh, now, wait a minute. Don't do anything stupid. Oh, you don't have to worry. I found out that I'm a terrible shot. But, but Dan's alive? See for yourself. Hello, Marty. Dan! Thank heavens you're okay. Look, Dan, I didn't mean for anything serious to happen. See the bandage, Marty? Just a flesh wound in my arm. I'll be okay. I'm glad to hear it, Danny. Honest, I am. <laughs> but I am learning to use my left arm, though. Like wait a minute, wait a minute. Oh, no, no, don't, please. I didn't mean to, don't, don't hit me again. Relax, Marty. I've got better things to do. I've got a honeymoon to finish. Although with any luck, it'll never end. So you see, even murder stories can have a happy ending. Martin Harvey may have spoiled Susan and Dan's honeymoon, but that doesn't mean he managed to spoil their marriage. No. If that's going to happen, Susan and Dan will take care of that all by themselves. I'll be back shortly. Hello, this is Joe Franklin. 
Ladies and gentlemen and boys and girls, for the very latest in nostalgia, for the ultimate in remembering, please join with me on Saturday nights from 9.05 to 11 o'clock, where memories are truly happening right here over WOR Radio. It is my privilege to present radio's original memory lane program, but positively the original. And whether it's Al Jolson or Benny Goodman or Louis Armstrong or Eddie Cantor or Harry James or the Dorseys, Mario Lanza, Gene Krupa, the young Frank Sinatra, George M. Cohan, Bing Crosby, Bogart, Lombard, Cagney, and all those happy times of radio's comedy and drama and soap opera. We have it. We have it fascinatingly. And all the sounds are reproduced crystal clear Saturday nights from 9.05 till 11 over at WOR Radio. You're truly Joe Franklin hosting Memory Lane. Tune in. WOR New York, your station for Mystery Theater. This is Sherry Henry. All New York knows it lost its governor recently when Rockefeller resigned. And we all know he's concerned now with his new commission on critical choices for America. But not many of us really understand what that commission is all about. Well, we'll all know more tomorrow afternoon when Henry Diamond, the executive director of that commission, divulges goals and directions. It's on the Sherry Henry program at 2.15 on WOR Radio. A purist might claim that the story you have just heard isn't a murder story since no one was actually killed. The murders which took place were all in the imagination of Martin Harvey, who passed them on to the mind of Susan Carey. But it's a good demonstration of the point we've tried to make all along, that the most terrifying crimes can happen within the theater of the mind. Our cast included Betsy von Furstenberg, Michael Wager, Elspeth Eric and Mason Adams. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Now, a preview of our next tale. What are you thinking about, child? The day you said it was bad luck for us to see each other before the wedding. Nobody believes those old wives' tales. Nobody believes so many things that are outside the ordinary. Did you see Michael's body after? Don't talk about that loss. I know they said the horse trampled him. I asked Dr. Ferguson about the hooves, and he wouldn't tell me. You'd tell me, wouldn't you, Jeannie? Oh, tell you what? Were they like horseshoes, or were they cleft in two? Were they cloven hooves? In the name of God, what are you saying? I'm not speaking of God. I'm speaking of the devil. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time... Pleasant dreams.